This is the first video in a new series on my channel, where I'll be teaching you all the essentials of organic chemistry for the MCAT. In this video, I'll be covering the basics of nomenclature associated with organic molecules, as well as recap the functional groups that can be present in any given molecule. This will be a quick video as it covers very simple concepts that will most likely not be directly tested on the exam, but it's still very important to know as they are applied to almost everything present in organic chemistry. Now first off, let's start by talking about how to name a molecule. IU, the IOPAC organization has created a naming system that should be used to identify and name any unknown molecule given to us. The first thing we have to note when given an unknown molecule is the length of the longest carbon chain given, and we have to number that chain. So let's start off with this one as an example. If we can start here or here, we'll note that the longest chain we find is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we know that this will be called a hexane. I'll get into naming uh, later. For now, we know that there will be six, so it will be called hexane. You can start from here. Like I said, it'll still be the same. You can start from here. It'll still be the same. I'll explain why I started here later on, though. So now that we identify the longest chain, we need to name the substituents. Substituents are the functional groups that branch off of the parent chain. These can be smaller carbon chains or completely different molecules altogether. Carbon chain substituents are named with a numerical prefix followed by the ol suffix. So a 5 carbon chain will be called pentyl, 6 carbon chain hexyl, 10 carbon chain decyl, and so on and so on. The exceptions to these are the first four numbers, not 1, 2, 3, 4. These will be called methyl, ethyl, propyl, and butyl chains. There is another set of exceptions called irregular chains. For the scope of the MCAT, these chains are Terbutyl, I'll draw these real quick. Terbutyl, the R stands for the remaining carbon chain going on. Uh, neopentyl, uh, isopropyl, secbutyl, and isobutyl. You need to know these for exam day as they will most they are almost guaranteed to show up as the regular chains. So the next step, like I said before, was to figure out the substituents. Knowing what substituents are, let's find the substituents here. We see an ethyl group here, two carbons, and a methyl group here, one carbon. Now, the next step we gotta take is assigning a number to these substituents. How do we know which number to assign? Why did I even start here? I have one. Sorry about that. So, I started here at 1 because in naming conventions, assuming that uh, we take priority into uh, into, uh, into account, uh, we would start off with a su substituent that is uh, closest to A in the alphabet. So we go out in alphabetical order. I'll talk about priority later in the video, but for now, since this is all just hydrocarbons, we can see that ethyl comes before methyl. So as a result, we would start with this group. That's why I started here. That's why starting here would be the correct way to go. Now, if there was another ethyl group or another methyl group present, we would have to call it dimethyl, and we have to uh, take into account where it would be located. So if we started off like here, if there was a methyl group, it'll be called 4,5-dimethyl uh, hexane. But there isn't, so we don't have to worry about that. So now that we've uh, numbered our substituents, we can take everything into account and we can finish naming this molecule. So we can call it 1, 2, 3, 3 ethyl, 5 methyl hexane. I understand this is a difficult example. I could have started off with something a bit easier like this. It'll be like two bromobutane. Wouldn't be that hard. But this is a very good example because it shows everything that's associated with naming a molecule in several carbon chains. This is very important as it showed all the IOPAC naming standards. Let's do the next example. As you can see here, there's a there's a hydroxide here and there's a bromine here. Which one will be taken account to first for priority? It's a hydroxyl group. Why is that? I'll explain that in the next slide. So before I start explaining, let's play a quick matching game. Pause the video and match each molecule to a description. 
it should be easy as it's one of the first things covered in an organic chemistry class. I'll reveal the answers in three, two, one. All right, let's start off with alkanes. Alkanes are molecules that are consisted of carbon chains. These carbon chains are exclusively single bonds. They're the simplest kinds of molecules that we can work with in organic chemistry. Knowing this, we can say that this molecule right here is an example of an alkane. This one. It's called butane. Alkenes are molecules that consist of at least one double bond. This molecule is an example of such. This one. We can call this one hexene, or hexon, or one hexene, sorry. You start off here, and you'd count your way over, because that of alkene has priority here. We name them depending on the location of the double bond of the chain, too. So you wouldn't start here, you'd start off here, as that's where it starts. Alkynes are like alkenes in both naming and uh, structure, but instead of double bonds, they consist of at least one triple bond. Oh, I'm so sorry. I drew an al alkyne here. I meant to ignore this one. It looks like this. It's an alkene. This is an alkyne. This one's an example of an alkyne right here. Four decine. Uh, lastly, we'll go over alcohols. Alcohols don't deal with bonds between carbon molecules, but instead they're distinguished by the presence of a hydroxyl group, or an OH, present in the molecule. So they would have OH bonds. It looks something like this. With alcohols, or with alcohols, it'll be this one right here because of the presence of this OH group. These are the significance right here. Now, with alcohols, there are two different kinds of uh, subcategories for these. They're called diols, and they're alcohols with two OH groups. These diols can be broken further into two different uh, categories called geminal and vicinal diols. Geminal diols are molecules with two hydroxyl groups on the same carbon. They can also be called hydrates. Now, you don't often see hydrates or geminal diols often. Uh, in real life because they dehydrate very quickly and spontaneously to create carbonyl compounds. I'll go over what carbonyl compounds are later. But you don't see them often, so as a result, you'll obviously see them, something about them on the exam as they'll throw you some curveball about them. The other type of diol is called a vicinal diol, and they have carbon or hydroxyl groups on adjacent carbons. Now that we know what their uh, structure would be, we can classify and name these compounds right here. This one is a geminal diol, as we have two hydroxides coming off of here. And we would call it propane 2,2 diol. This one right here, we see that they have adjacent carbons with hydroxides coming off, so we would call it cyclohexane 1,2 diol. Now let's talk about naming priority. Alcohols have priority over alkynes, alkenes, and alkanes. So these guys, they're number one. Alkynes and alkenes are actually interchangeable. But regardless of whatever is present, the alcohol will always come out uh, on top. So for, for the uh, for previous example, we saw there was a bromine, but it's still going to be considered an alcohol. So let's think of another example right here. You see that they're like it's still like this. It's, this would be an alkane, which is an OH group coming off, but it's not because there is an OH, or a hydroxyl group, making it an alcohol. So therefore, we call this one, two, three, four. We would call this two butanol. The last thing we should cover would be the naming conventions of the simple ones. As I said before, methyl, ethyl, propyl, and butyl. Those cover the first four. So this one would be methane. This would be, there's two, so this would be ethane, we've seen three here, propane, 
and butane. If this was an alcohol, or if these were uh, uh, alkynes, alkenes, they would still follow the same methyl, ethyl, propyl procedures, but instead of ene, it'll be ene, ine, or all, depending on which one it is. Now, let's move on to aldehydes and ketones. These molecules are categorized by their carbonyl groups, which are the oxygen atoms double bonded to a carbon atom. So this one right here. This is what I was talking about before when I was talking about carbonyl groups. Let's start off with aldehydes first. Aldehydes are form-ending, so they appear at the end of the carbon chain. Because of this, they usually would not be numbered when they are being named, as the naming standard would start at the beginning of the aldehyde. Exceptions occur when there are groups that have a higher priority than aldehydes, which I'll get into later in this video. Their suffix is all, and their prefix is oxo. This prefix is rarely used, but I would still get familiar with it, as if there's any prefix that you'll see on the exam, it'll be associated with aldehydes and ketones. Now let's talk about simple aldehydes. Instead of methanol, ethanol, and propanol, the first three simple aldehydes present are called formaldehyde, this one right here, acetylaldehyde, this one, and propionaldehyde, this one. Aldehydes with four more carbons follow the standard naming procedures. So now let's move on to ketones. Ketones are found in the middle of the chain. So you see right here, there's one, two, three, and you see that there's one right there. So they'll be numbered when, because they're found in the middle, they'll be, they'll be numbered. The suffix for uh, ketones is own, and the prefix is oxo or keto. Keto is easy to remember as keto ketones. You need at least three carbons to make a ketone. So there is no methone or ethone simple structure. The smallest possible ketone you can get would be propanone, but, it, but the, uh, we refer to it as acetone. Before I move on, let me discuss the priorities of these groups with the naming process and, uh, and all that. Aldehydes are prioritized over ketones. So if you see a molecule with both uh, an aldehyde and a ketone, so, for example, if you see something like this, note that this would be considered to be an aldehyde. I'll cover the priorities of all the molecules that I'll discuss at the end of the lecture. Don't worry about having to like write down all the different priorities and figure that all out. I'll have a chart for it at the end. Now, the last set of molecules I want to cover are called carboxylic acid derivatives. These molecules are indicated by the presence of a carboxyl group or COO, that would be, or COOH, sorry, that would be this group right here. These are always terminal, so once again, you won't be numbering them during the naming process. Their suffix is oic acid, and their three simple structures are formic acid, this one right here, acetic acid, and propanoic acid. These carboxylic acids serve as the backbone for the derivatives, which are their own separate molecules with their own special properties. Let's look at the first derivative, esters. Esters are noted by the fact that the OH group is replaced by an alkoxy group, or an OR group. So this right here, instead of being an OH, this would be an OR group. The R stands for any carbon chain, and it extends from the initial oxygen. In future videos, I'll cover the specifics of esters and all the other carboxylic acids, as they are kind of complicated, but for nomenclature, you only need to know the suffix. Oh, wait. Now, when you're naming these, uh, you should start off on the side with the OR group. You would start off here. So this uh, would be called, and this is an ethyl group, right? Coming from uh, the OR group. Coming from here, it's a 1, 2, 3 propyl group. So this molecule right here would be called ethyl propanoate. Knowing this, how will we name this one? Remember, start off with where the, the, the OR group starts. So you see one, two, three, one, two, three. So this will be called propyl propanoate.
But, so now let's move on to the next group. Amides. Amides are characterized by the nitrogen group present. So this one. Or this one. They replace the OH group. Their suffix is amide, and when naming molecules amide, an N prefix is usually used to signify the bond where it is present. So for example, on this molecule right here, you see that there is an N coming off of or which has two methyl groups coming off. So we would call it NN dimethyl ethanamide. That's kind of a workful because of the two methyl groups that are attached to the nitrogen. Now, now knowing this, what we, we name this one. If you figured it out, it'll be one, two, three, and then you have the nitrogen group. So this will be propanam, propanam, yeah, sorry. Now, the last uh, derivative I'll cover is called the anhydride. Anhydrides are the combination of two carboxylic acids through the removal of one moderate molecule. So when you think about it, this right here, this is a simple uh, carboxylic acid. So if you combine these two and remove a water molecule, so if you remove two H's and one O, you would end up getting something like this. You can see in the example that this is a this is actually exactly that. It's called acetic anhydride, and it's literally just two carboxylic acids combined together minus the 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 water that would normally be in the center. Their suffix is just anhydride, and if they're not symmet symmetrical, like this one right here, uh, they will be uh have to be named with both the. Uh, the groups attached to them, minus the acid suffix. So this one will be called ethanoic, propanoic, and hydride because the presence of this ethyl, uh, or this, yeah, this ethyl group here, and this propyl group here. So ethanoic, propanoic, and hydride. That about does it for nomenclature with this uh, uh, course. We covered the basic functional groups as well. Let's do a quick review of the groups and then we can figure out which ones are prioritized over the others when it comes to naming. In this last slide, I've prepared a chart that highlights all the details that you would need to know about functional groups for the test. I've ordered them based off of priority. So carboxylic acids are groups that will always be used to name the molecule. So this one is always prioritized. Alkanes are groups that usually won't unless there are no other groups present. So these are last. The priority of these groups are based off of their oxidation states. That's how we've all determined this. However, that won't be tested on the MCAT. Just know the order of the priority of these molecules. And another thing uh, I would like to say before I move on will be that uh, alkenes and alkynes, like I said before, they're tied for priority, except in the presence of cyclic compounds. So whenever you see something like this, if you see an alkene or an alkyne present there, the alkene will have slight will be slightly preferred. So we'll name it according to the alkene instead of the alkyne. Now I've also added uh, prefixes and suffixes to this chart. I wouldn't particularly worry about any of the prefixes apart from oxo, keto, and hydroxy. These are the ones that are most commonly uh, seen on the exam. I'll, I rarely think you'll ever get an anhydride prefix or an ester prefix, thank God. So yeah, just make sure you know these three. Uh, be familiar with these, at least. But like I said, they won't be extensively tested. Suffixes are the important part, though. I recommend memorizing this entire column. Learn all of it. Uh, lastly, I would recommend learning the simple structures of the compounds, as they're definitely going to be tested on the exam. That's about all I have for you guys. I hope this was very informative. I hope it helped you uh, refresh on the naming process that we learned in uh, the beginning of OCHEM in our OCHEM classes. If this video helped you, feel free to like, subscribe, and share. And if you feel like you have any questions about these topics, uh, please feel free to leave me a comment and I'll answer as best as I can. Once again, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you all in my next OCHEM video, which will be covering isomers.